All right, are we recording? All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for participating in our uh, second community forum on the K-8 strategic project and primary school building project. Um, at first, before we get to our slides for this evening, I wanted um, just to uh, offer everyone the opportunity to introduce themselves who's on uh, our webinar this evening and will be helping with the presentation. Um, I'll start, I'm Jeff Bruno, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, I'm Andrew Bradley, I'm a community member and co-chair of the building committee. Dana Fortier, I'm a community member and uh, co-chair of the uh, building committee. Excellent, and I'm Lisa Sawan, architect with Harriman. I'm Emily Wah, I'm also with Harriman. I'm Al Palmer from Goral Palmer. Doug Reynolds with Goral Palmer as well. And I'm Dianetta, the assistant superintendent. All right, great. Lisa, if you wouldn't mind putting up the first slide and share that for this evening. Uh, okay, so again, this is our uh, second community forum. Um, our, and our first community forum was held on the 11th of May. Um, tonight's, tonight's focus is gonna be on the site selection overview. Um, prior, to, prior to doing that, we're gonna, we're gonna take the first uh, 15 minutes or so and just review for folks uh, some things that, that we went over certainly as part of the first community forum on May 11th. Uh, a little bit of the project background. Uh, we'll, so we'll take about 15 minutes to kind of go through a few of those slides and then transition right into um, the site selection overview, uh, talk about the process, the criteria we use to select uh, a school site, and um, also a, a, a participatory exercise that, that uh, Al Palmer from uh, Goral Palmer will be leading us uh, through. And then following that, well, about five minutes just uh, to review some, some next steps, uh, where, where this project is headed from here, uh, and then also have some time at the end uh, for some Q&A. So, uh, but first the, the project background and a little bit of, uh, of a review of why and, and how we got here. Uh, so first, I think it's just important to point out that the facilities needs um, K through eight uh, is not, uh, this is not, these are, these are not new problems. Um, a lot of our buildings in particular K to two and at the middle school uh, we have already exceeded the capacity of our existing schools. So uh, our current infrastructure does not support basic educational needs for our students. Uh, and we need a sustainable solution to house uh, our current population and likely uh, enrollment to grow in the future. So we need to find the solution to support today's kids and plan, plan for continued housing, housing starts. Uh, this construction process will take approximately five years. So uh, some of the goals as, as again, this is um, uh, not a new problem, um, consolidating the three primary schools as part of a K to eight strategic solution, remove all 30 of the district portables. So currently uh, we have 30 portables uh, between our three K to two schools and our middle school. Uh, so alleviate overcrowding at the middle school and then also coordinate and align uh, this project with other community initiatives uh, and the town comprehensive plan. So um, a little more on the project background and focusing on the impact of, of doing nothing. Uh, so we continue, we will continue to face overcrowding in our schools and on uh, in particular at our K-2 campus, uh, we are simply out of room to add any more portables. So should we experience continued um, growth and enrollment, particularly at the K to two level, uh, there's just no, no more future room to add uh, portable classrooms. Safety and security issues, two out of the three primary schools do not have a secure front entry vestibule. Uh, a lack of sufficient storage can lead to stor uh, storage in hallways, which impacts egress. Students travel out of the building to access classrooms and portables at eight corners. The site circulation is problematic. Uh, there's little separation between parent and bus drop-offs at multiple schools. 
and insufficient room to queue cars for at uh, arrival and drop off. In addition, a lot of the schools do not have sufficient security cameras. There are also inadequate or missing program spaces. And then energy inefficiency continues to be an issue, um, particularly at our, our smaller schools. And as a result of having three separate uh, facilities, much higher operational costs due to the age of the buildings and then the small size of the facilities. Um, you know, so therefore the cost per square foot in particular at our K to, K to two schools are much higher uh, than in particular our um, large Wentworth school for grades three through five. So those are just some of the big bullets uh, of possible impacts of, of, of not doing anything to address these issues. There are also many program inadequacies as this slide kind of highlights, having the combined cafeteria and gymnasium spaces at our small school really limits uh, the use and function of our space and then also impacts how we schedule um, our programs for, for our youngest learners. Um, that combined space creates a lot of scheduling difficulties and then it also cuts, cuts in on specialist times in particular for art, music and um, wellness and PE and gym. So the late and early lunches also impact the students um, overall programming. The 18 portable classrooms among the primary schools, uh, 18 out of the 30 temporary portable classrooms are on these sites. Um, more, of more than half of them have been in use uh, for 20 years. Over the years, more and more portables have been added uh, and then even connecting portables to portables. Students must leave the building at eight corners and the middle school to access the cafeteria and gymnasium, library or other program spaces. This can also pose a safety concern. Um, and as part of this, there's also insufficient meeting spaces, um, small if any art music rooms and then inadequate space to address our special education needs for our, um, for our students who need more personalized learning programs. Uh, finally, uh, just a, a reminder, we wanted to, to share the links. Uh, if you weren't able to join us for the first community forum in May, again, that has been recorded as, as is this evening's uh, community forum and will be posted and easily accessible on our webpage linked to our website. Um, and then there's also a two pager view the about handout, which kind of uh, summarizes and reviews some of what I've just been talking about in the last couple of slides. So we wanted to share uh, where and how you can learn more about the project. All right. Jeff, thank you so much. Um, so just a kind of overview of where we're at in the process and what the process looks like. Um, so this is what we call the Roadmap to Successful Project. Um, this information we're working on now is leading up to a referendum. And really a lot of this is um, above the yellow line is really the stakeholder engagement, community engagement internal to the school, external in the greater community. You can see we've noted that we are at the second community forum. And just because there are three bubbles doesn't mean we'll just have three forums, but it indicates there'll be multiple community forums to keep everyone informed and involved in this process throughout. We really encourage everyone to be involved, reach out to everyone you know to get involved. Um, this can only be a success if everyone um, is involved and uh, is part of the process. You can see in the yellow, really the three major phases that go up to a referendum um, in the planning of the school, the programming of the school, and then coming up with a concept design um, that we then um, budget and put forth um, uh, to voters. A parallel to that process is really what we're talking about tonight, and that's the site selection process. And it is just that, it's a process. And we're gonna go over what that process is, what the many steps are, and what information we'd love to hear from you um, to help uh, us continue forth with that process. And with that, we're going to have Al Palmer and Doug Reynolds from Goral Palmer, who is consulting um, with the team on site selection, go over the process. And then we have some really great interactive activities for everyone to participate in. So I'll pass it over to you, Al. Thank you, Lisa. As Lisa indicated, Goral Palmer is assisting Harriman in the school department in evaluating sites 
we are a civil engineering firm located in South Portland. We've worked in Scarborough since the founding of our firm in 1998. So we're very familiar uh, with the, the land in the town of Scarborough, as well as the uh, administrative process that will be required to get a site approved once one is selected. So we're going to start with an overview of the site selection process. And this outlines five different steps in that process, but there are sub um, parts of each item. And as you'll see under number one, there's preliminary meetings under the blue. Um, step B is partly part of the discussion tonight. So we've had introductory meetings with the building committee and establish the process for the review of alternative sites. We've also had a, the opportunity to discuss criteria with the, the building committee and to understand the importance of those criteria within the community. As I believe Lisa indicated, the site selection process is guided by the consultants, but it's not directed by the consultants and it's not um, the final decision is not made by the consulting team. The, the community really is the, the entity and the building committee and the school board are the entities that will determine what is the optimum site for the proposed school. There is typically no ideal site. We'll find a handful of sites that appear to be the, the most optimal, and they'll all have varying criteria and factors um, that will be evaluated against each other to determine um, the site to move forward with. So our role in that of Harriman is to assist those entities in guiding the process, uh, but really it is the community's decision where this school should be constructed. So as part of those preliminary meetings, one of, the fa one of the items is the weighting of the criteria and what is most important to Scarborough. We will evaluate each site based upon a, a list of different factors, but we need to hear what is the most important um, to each of you. The, as noted on the slide, step two is data collection. That is a combination of GIS, which is basically just previously mapped information that's available either through the town of Scarborough, the state of Maine, or other agencies. In addition, we have the ability to um, obtain local data, such as from the Portland Water District and the Scarborough Sanitary District, Maine Department of Transportation, as well as field observations. Doug and I have practiced uh, for an excess of 30 years uh, within the area, and we know a lot of the alternative sites that would be considered for this uh, facility, as well as some of the, the currently underdeveloped site. And then the other item, which is again part of this meeting, is the community can identify sites or identify constraints on potential sites, and that is something that is valuable for us. Uh, that anecdotal information can, can um, fill in some of the uh, gaps of what may be mapped data. So then there's basically a three-step process where the screening of the sites will narrow down and ultimately lead to a short handful of sites under the tier one screening. That will be dozens of sites. Um, I would anticipate we would be in the 40 to 40 plus sites that would be considered. And we'll be looking at those sites on kind of a macro criteria. What is the overall area? What is the length to width ratio? Is it on utilities? Those factors to allow us to do a rapid assessment and to narrow the, the list of sites down. Uh, we would be meeting with the building committee to review those findings and then develop the tier two list. Under the tier two screening, we'll probably be in the one to two dozen sites that may re result in a field review of each parcel, uh, looking at more distinct criteria uh, and a higher level of, of degree, but also potentially doing a bubble diagram 
we know that there are certain components for this project that are going to be necessary. There'll be an overall building envelope. There'll be parking envelope. There'll be a parent drop off, a bus drop off, play area, stormwater management. Those items all together are in the 25 plus acre range and how those items may fit together on a site, depending on the shape and configuration of the site, will be important for the long-term operation of, of the project and the ability of the school department to function going forward. That list will probably be narrowed down to three to four sites that will be at the highest um, criteria in being looking at uh, all of those factors, again, potentially a public meeting. Under the tier three screening is when we start doing the more in-depth review. That may include a, a on the ground field delineation of any wetlands. Up to that point, we we're using map data or data that we may have on file from prior evaluation of a property. Um, at that point, we will be looking at working with Harriman and the building committee to see how those various factors all interrelate, how those, fa those different components of the building, uh, the pro building program may be combined in looking at the potential on and off site cost comparison. A site that requires extension of a water main would need to factor in that type of uh, of a cost where one that's already within the gridded system of the community, that doesn't need to be considered. We would then again be meeting with the building committee and potentially the school board members to narrow the list further down and then a public meeting um, to review those findings with the greater community. The next slide kind of gives an overview of the various 11 various criteria that, that we typically look at under a site selection process. As you can see on the left-hand side, they range from safety, environment, location, topography, utilities, traffic, public services, cost availability, community involvement, and local criteria. The list is not intended to be in any particular order. Um, and not necessarily weight, uh, reflecting any specific weighting. Uh, those could easily be A through whatever the 11th letter of the alphabet is. Um, so I know <laughs> I was trying to do it in my head. Um, so from safety standpoint, um, some of these are items that we've developed based on working in other communities. Um, and they, they may or may not be applicable to the town of Scarborough. But a feature that could disqualify a site might be being located within 1500 feet of a, of a railroad track. Proximity to a high accident location that can't be mitigated or improved upon. Um, there's significant concerns in some communities relative to being uh, in close proximity to either high voltage power lines or uh, gas lines, as well as is the site known to have any specific um, contaminants within the soil uh, because of past use. Another item that could be a significant factor is the 100 year floodplain proximity. Obviously with items such as sea level rise, we, this facility wants to have a design life um, that, reflects the community's investment and we need to make sure um, that it's properly cited. The environment, these are desirable features and I'm not gonna read them all. Um, and there's always a degree uh, when you start to look at these items. A wetland, typically within the state of Maine, one third of every site is a wetland. Um, so a wetland by in and of itself would not disqualify a site from consideration, but if a site had 40 to 50 uh, percent wetlands and it's highly fragmented so that the upland areas are not contiguous, that could disqualify a site. In addition, 
under the DEP criteria, there are significant wetlands. Uh, those may be within close proximity to a, a stream, a coastal wetland or other features. In addition, there are features within wetlands called vernal pools. Those vernal pools are amphibian breeding habitat and require additional evaluation depending on the level of activity within a vernal pool. It can be de deemed significant and that can result in need to provide buffer areas. So again, we're looking at sites from these criteria uh, to judge their relative merit compared to others. With respect to location and future expansion, um, there are certain things that you'd like to see. Um, are there opportunities for students to walk to the school? And is it a, in a safe walking area? Is it within a designated growth area of the comprehensive plan? And are there existing or future adjacent land uses that may not be desirable from a school standpoint. One of the significant factors that um, likely will guide this, this process will be the geographic size of the community and how do we locate a site to minimize student travel distance. Um, Scarborough from a geographic standpoint is one of the larger Southern Maine communities. And when you look at the outlying areas trying to locate a, a site so that the busing routes are manageable will be a, a significant factor. In addition to in, excuse me, indoor learning, we also would like to have the opportunity to have some outdoor learning spaces. Those ideally would be upland areas uh, where you could have um, opportunities for outdoor classrooms, learning experiences, and other factors. Um, where could we locate a site? Uh, can we locate a site that has co-location co benefits, such as a library, other community services that the, the population could benefit from? Soils and topography, um, as most of you know, um, nope. Okay. There's a couple, uh, couple on location. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, and again, not every site is going to have the opportunity to be um, a maximum of any of these specific criteria. But is there an opportunity for a favorable orientation for the building for wind and natural light? Does the does the site have an opportunity to have a southern exposure for the main entrance or will it have to be on a northern exposure? We've done schools with northern exposures. It just is a fact that we have to incorporate certain aspects into the design. What is the opportunity for solar orientation? The Department of Education establishes overall net acreage for each level of um, education within the state of Maine. For an elementary school, it is 20 acres, quote, minimum area plus um, one additional acre for each 100 students. So a 25 to 32 acre site would likely be what would be um, necessary. But we also want to have a nice length to width ratio. We can't have a, a flag lot um, that's long and skinny, rectangulars and square are are better uh, from a sighting standpoint and being able to have the bus drop off, the parent drop off, integrate well with the building. Um, is there an opportunity to have a primary and a secondary access to the existing road system? Where is the site located relative to emergency um, response vehicles? And are there opportunities for um, enhanced pedestrian opportunities to, to and from the site, and how do we connect to those existing facilities. The next slide. While a significant portion of the town of Scarborough was relatively level in grade, there are sites that have significant grade relief. Um, a site that require, that has a five foot differential in grade across the building envelope would have a lower cost to develop 
than a site that would have 15 feet of elevation difference? And do we have obstacles that prevent uh, or restrict access? Is there a stream crossing that is required? Is it at a known intersection that needs improvements to handle additional turning movements? And is it remote from an existing uh, neighborhood location where you may not have any sidewalks? Soils and topography, um, septic likely is not gonna be required because that would only for the most part be on sites that are west of the interstate. Um, but there we would like to have a site that doesn't require significant um, improvements to have acceptable soil conditions. The a lot, amount of fill that may be necessary underneath the building and the cuts that are required for that, having level areas for playing fields and, and being able to mitigate steep slopes. Um, significant cut and fill can result in a site being disqualified from a cost standpoint. And if we ended up with significant amount of rock um, bedrock removal, that also could disqualify a site from a cost standpoint. From a utility standpoint, um, you can see some of the, the desired features, proximity to three-phase power, high-speed internet, public water and sewer. Um, a school can be con constructed on a well system and septic, but those do come at a, a premium. In addition, we need to have the ability to do uh, stormwater tr treatment for both quantity and quality. If there's land area to do that at grade, that will be at a lesser cost than if a site is significantly constrained and we need to put those improvements underneath a parking area or, or another hard surface. This map, which is a little bit hard to see at this scale, um, shows the public water and sewer within the town. As you can see, the sewer is within is depicted in green, the water is in blue. And one of the striking things is basically all of those utilities, for the most part, end at the interstate. The interstate basically bisects the town and though there has not been significant extension of those public utilities across the interstate. That is not uncommon um, in the state. Most of the communities along the interstate, the public utilities are all on the eastern side of the interstate. Traffic. Um, obviously, traffic is a significant concern within the town of Scarborough. Um, and making sure that we have adequate sight distance, that there's opportunities for pedestrian and bicycle access. Is there sufficient right of way for turning lanes? Is, is the site proximate to the population centroid? And is it proximate to the school population centroid? Lisa, if you could go back one slide. If you could point out the centroid, um, All right. Oop, we lost it. There we go. So the Can you dot. See my, see my mouse right there? Yep. Okay. So the dot that Lisa is circling, circling, circling is the centroid of the town from a geographic standpoint. You then have uh, one mile radius circles emanating from that. So the first one is one mile, then a two mile, then a three mile, et cetera. As you can see, when you get over into West Scarborough, um, you're, you're out to, I believe that's a six mile radius. And when you look at travel distances, it's, it's even greater um, because you've got to get across the interstate and then travel north south. So one of the things that we'll, we need to consider from a transportation standpoint is how proximate a site might be to that population centroid and ultimately the travel times to and from a facility. Um, Lisa, back on that one, that 
if we could point out the existing school campus. The one with the high school is yes. right here. All right, so that way just to give people perspective, your high school is there. So the uh, the geographic centroid is just below, I believe that's Hagus Parkway and um, kind of southwest of Hagus Parkway. All right, so back to the next slide. Thank you, Lisa. Oops, went too far, there you go. So again, from a traffic standpoint, um, there are items that can uh, disqualify a site. There's actually a state criteria that you cannot locate a, a school or public facility on a mobility corridor with greater than 45 miles per hour speeds. That won't be an issue necessarily for this location. Uh, but one of the items that we have to consider are high accident locations, avail availability of um, any limitations on busing, as well as factors such as truck traffic and adjacent driveways. I think the next slide shows some of the high accident locations within uh, the town. Those red dots are current high accident locations. The segments or the, the short red lines are segments of roadways that have high accident, um, meet the definition of the DOT high accident locations. And those can be mitigated um, by either the DOT or as part of a project. So it doesn't necessarily preclude it, a, a site, but it is something that we need to consider and whether there is um, potential mitigation to um, address those high accident locations. Public services. Again, this is a shorter list, but basically, you know, avail availability and proximity to fire and police protection, including fire lanes um, surrounding the building. Is there an opportunity for availability of public transportation and then um, a lesser item relative to trash and garbage disposal? Cost. Um, in evaluating sites, we'll be looking at how do, how do sites compare on a number of different factors. Um, one is the purchase price. Uh, what's the overall purchase price and is it reasonable compared to similar sites? Uh, that are being evaluated. What are the on-site costs, including site preparation, uh, demolition, drainage, parking driveways, et cetera? Uh, those are all the on-site factors. It is not um, out of the ordinary that because of some of the soil conditions within the town, we could be looking at doing um, some site improvements to allow the, from a soil standpoint for um, a building on a site and therefore we'd have to include that. But also we have to factor in offsite costs, including utility extensions and any traffic improvements that may be necessary, including turning lanes, signals, um, or other mitigation measures. And then we wanna look at the, the life cycle costs and are there any factors that are significant that could result in higher than anticipated maintenance costs from one site to another. Um, environmental mitigation can be a, an issue if there's a site that may be more of a brownfield and is there a need to do mitigation relative to a past use. Um, in more rural areas, I've seen for school sites, apple orchards um, being a concern from an, an environmental mitigation standpoint. One of the pesticides used on apple orchard was based um, on, with an arsenic type chemical and testing on those sites can, can lead to needing to do mitigation. Likely not an issue in Scarborough, but those are the types of factors that we need to be cons um, consider. consider. Availability. Um, is the site either on the market or have a potential willing seller, if not on the market? Can we get title to the property? And are there any items that 
could be a, a disqualifier such as a deed restriction, an easement or other factor. Um, is there some type of a restriction that precludes the desired use of the site? Um, again, those all affect cost. Community involvement, obviously, we're trying to consolidate three local schools into uh, one consolidated school. So we critical to acceptance at a referendum is to have a public acceptance of the proposed site, that the, the host neighborhood is receptive to it, and that we have a public process that's transparent as to how the site was selected. Um, that site also should be consistent with future plans um, for the community in that area and how the, the town looks at what changes may occur over the next 30, 40, 50 years. Um, again, a feature that can disqualify a site is an environmental impact that the community would not accept. Um, again, is there some type of co contamination on the site that because of um, the outdoor use could uh, be a concern for the community? So one of our first activities uh, for the evening is those 10 criteria um, that are in no particular order, um, as Al was trying to allude to earlier, could be A through J. Um, essentially, they are 10 criteria that are used plus community criteria. And we're going to ask you in a little bit about community specific criteria, but we'd really like to hear from the participants tonight in regards to the 10 criteria that Al just went over with all of us. How would you prioritize those 10 criteria? And in a minute here, we're going to change to a slide that will provide you a web link, as well as a code um, that you can go to to be able to um, access the poll. And we will be able to start to see some of those results live. Um, so on this slide, you'll see the code up at the top. Um, or if you would like to go to slido.com and put in the number that is down there, you will be taken to a live poll and we'll ask you to prioritize those top or to prioritize those 10 criteria or categories um, so we can see what the priorities are um, from the group. Um, and so we'll give folks a couple minutes here to sign in and get that going. If anyone needs help, please, uh, message us in the chat and we can try to um, get you connected to the web link. There we go. Let's see someone in the chat. Code isn't working. Um, Emily, if you can go to slido.com, so www.slido.com and enter the number, um, give that a try and see if that works for you. And if it doesn't let us know, we'll try to see if we can find a workaround. Yes, the 8866113. Great, thank you, Todd, for letting us know it worked for you. It looks like we've had eight, nine, and we're growing in numbers. This is great. Anybody else having trouble with accessing the poll? I 
I don't think you have to put a space in. Um, and like try it without the space and see if that works. Perfect, no space works. <laughs> All right, we have it's like 10 so far. We'll give another, another 30 seconds or so for, for folks to get their responses in. Um, but I can see we're already starting to see um, some prioritization and there we go. We have 11. So, oops, just switch to the slide. Sorry about that. My mouse is a little finicky tonight. Um, so what we can see is in the priority uh, prioritization of the group here tonight, um, it looks like the highest priority is location slash future expansion. And right behind that, um, safety. And then shortly behind that, traffic, transportation, and safety. I think it's clear from this group that those are the top three priorities. And the next three or four kind of clustered together here a little bit. Um, next three definitely are clustered together. And that would be environment, public services, and availability. And then um, behind that, we have community involvement cost, utilities, and soils and topography. Um, Al, any reflec reflections on what you're seeing here for priorities or, or Jeff or others? I mean, from an engineering standpoint, it's pretty consistent with what we've seen for um, other projects. The ability to have the future expansion and how does it fit into the community from a location standpoint is always very high on the list, as well as safety and traffic. Um, as long as there's no geotechnical engineers on in the meetings or on the webinars, typically soils and top topography are very low on uh, the public standpoint. So very consistent with what I've seen for other communities. Interesting a little bit to see the the bands, and that's really what we're looking at is those bands, as, as Lisa said, one, two, and three are pretty much grouped together, four, five, six, seven um, are grouped together, and then you start to see a little bit more separation as you get down um, to the lower items. Any, any comments from the participants or the panel before we move on to the next question? Okay, we um, did a similar um, study with the building uh, committee and we'll also, with this information and that information, start to look at where there is alignment. If there is any um, uh, misalignment, we'll look at where that is and, and be able to come up with a um, shared priority list. So this is great. Thank you guys for the feedback on this. The next one um, we're gonna look at are what additional community criteria do you feel is important to prioritize? Um, so we'll do another um, Slido poll here. Um, and it's more of an open-ended um, response. So what are those items um, that you wanna share um, with the, the design team and the committee and the community um, that are those community criteria that need to be, um, feel are important to prioritize. So on this one, you can go to um, the Slido poll um, as well. Looks like folks have started to find it already, which is great. And again, if any help is needed, please um, uh, engage us in the chat below. So I'm gonna give you a community criteria that doesn't apply, but something that you could get um, a, a sense of what could be important. If there was a landmark within the town that you wanted to have a school uh, be within walking distance of, that could be a, a community criteria. So location, the one that sh shows up right now is that sounds like they have separate wings so that the school could be broken down um, in size to feel like individual communities. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Another another one we've seen in some other communities, if there's a certain area in town, I think we pointed out the centroid and um, the center of Scarborough, sometimes there's, uh, to your point, a landmark that is important that they want to be near. They sometimes will say within a mile radius or within a two mile radius of, of that important landmark or area. Um, or uh, adjacencies to fields or other um, community um, items. Excellent, we have some responses coming in already. Um, we talked about the small wings to make the school feel uh, like individual communities. Um, so making sure that we have ample space for um, that type of um, organizational pattern, as we call it. Um, space to make access to green spaces easy. Uh, so adjacency to that, that green space and make it easy, I imagine, for um, both during school and after school and uh, student access. Green space outside for flexible learning. Stay within three to four miles of school campus. Um, aesthetics of uh, structure and landscaping. Centralized location. Cell phone service. I've heard nightmares of the current middle and high school um, not having service on site. Ability to support special programs such as STEM, arts, etc. Good security given recent events. School as a talent and community attractor. And some more comments coming in here. Looks like we have some a uh, couple couple comments around centralized location, um, some connection to green space, um, access to different services. If you are someone whose child would potentially ride the bus versus being dropped off at a facility, um, those are criteria that are important for us to understand. Very much in alignment with the comment that just came in, located in a place to keep travel to and from the school from being, a, being hard uh, for some, but easy for others. Easy for young students to find their way around the school without feeling scared and overwhelmed. A couple, a couple comments in regards to the building itself, um, but that does impact that does impact site selection in regards to the footprint and the layout. Any other reflections on community criteria um, from our participants this evening or uh, members of the panel? All right. Well, great. Those are that is some great feedback um, for us um, uh, to uh, summarize and also uh, t look at in comparison to some of the community criteria um, that uh, we've heard from the building committee thus far. And I think we'll have a, a, a pretty um, consistent list um, from um, the two different groups and we'll be able to summarize that after this forum and share that as well. Um, so next, um, we are going to queue up another um, uh, <clears throat> engagement exercise here. And um, Al, you wanna tell us a little bit about the map that we're looking at? All right, so hopefully there's nobody that's color challenged in looking at this map. Um, what this map is, is the representation of the town. Um, the turnpike is going north-south and is basically at about the third point coming in um, from plan west. What we did was we color-coded various size parcels so that you can see the relative size of those parcels. As we indicated earlier, <laughs> we need approximately 25 to 30 acres of usable area for the proposed building program. Dark green sites on this map are 
basically conserved lands. Um, the large green block that you see in the center is, is the Scarborough Marsh. Uh, but there are a number of conserved parcels throughout the town. They're in that dark green um, shade. Um, they could be open space that was done as part of a, um, a subdivision. They could be parcels owned by the land trust, or there are a few parcels owned by uh, Department of Inland Fisheries or other state agencies. So on the co color coding, they range from parcels between 20 and 30 acres. That is kind of a, a tannish color. 30 to 40 acres is more orangish. 40 to 50 is a uh, kind of a light red. A purple is between 50 and 70. A, I'll call it lighter blue with 75 to 150. And then a darker blue is 150, over 150 acres. Um, within the central portion of the, the drawing, Lisa, if you could point out where the Scarborough Down site is, that's probably a landmark that everybody knows. Yep, that's the dark or darker blue one. Um, that is the Scarborough Downs campus. You can see there's stars for the individual schools. So the blue star is the intermediate school. You should play a little bit of Where's Waldo. You can th see the three elementary schools. So you may want to point out this is Pleasant Hill. Pleasant Hill. You've got eight corners, and then you've got. Blue I think point. I was just showing Blue Point. Blue oh, Point is okay. down here, and we have eight corners up here. Up and then right where we we're showing the intermediate, um, you have the high school and the middle school as well. So you've got those landmarks that are on this as well. In the the centroid, the geographic centroid is again just below uh, the Scarborough Downs parcel, uh, kind of on the other side of Hagus, Hagus Parkway, or Hagus Parkway, I always mispronounce that. Perfect, all right, great. Thank you for that overview, oh, that's um, incredibly helpful. Um, the next um, question we have for everybody this evening is, um, we're still collecting the data and everything on different sites, but generally want to understand from everybody in this group, um, which grid square, and as you can see, we've kind of broken this map into different um, squares, um, represents the general area in which you would like to see the new primary school. And so the way to read this graphic is across the top, you have A through G. So um, columns A through G and down the sides you have rows one through four. And so looking at the map, um, they, it is divided into different cells. So let's say that I wanted to see a school in this, just picking a random square, this one right here, it would be F2. So that's F2 here. On the next slide, um, you'll see a poll for another um, Slido poll asking to select the grid square that represents the general area in which you would like to see the new primary school. Um, again, general, um, so not necessarily site specific, but general area. Um, and I'm gonna leave this up for about another 30 seconds or so, so folks can look at the map um, before I move to the Slido poll. Um, and then I'm gonna to move to the Slido poll and I can move back to this map so folks can see it because you will not see it in the poll itself. Um, so I'll leave it up here for a little bit while longer. Um, and just again, a reminder that this is the school campus here. You have Pleasant Hill here. We have Blue Point down here. We have eight corners up here. And then this is the center of um, Scarborough. So you can see the shading of the various parcels that are kind of muted. So you can see kind of the approximate distribution of the larger properties within each grid square. As an example, G4 is the Prouts Neck community. And you can see there's only one parcel that's in that area and it's conservation. Um, so you can also get an idea of not just the, the geographic location of each grid square compared to the centroid and the campus, but you can also see how many 
potential sites there are within each grid square. Perfect. All right, I'm going to jump over to the poll. And so here is the next Slido question for this evening. I'll wait till I see a couple folks active in here, um, make sure folks are able to access it and then we'll move back to the map um, so that um, everyone can look perfect. All right, so we see folks are in there and move back to the map. If folks need me to move into um, uh, the poll again, just let me know down in the chat. I'm going to jump to the, oh, I see a question in the chat. I can move back to the poll, yes. There you go. If folks need me to move back to the map, just let me know in the chat and I can go back and forth. Now, Lisa, if they pick one and then they change their mind, can they? I believe so. I believe you can overwrite it. Yep, we can okay. move back to the map. Let me get there. Oops, too far. One more. Well, there you go. So G4 is kind of the Atlantic Ocean for the most part. I think somebody wanted it on Prout Snack. <laughs> Beautiful location for her. I think the golf course is actually on G3, though. Flip back to the poll for a minute and let me know if folks need to go back to the map. Just to kind of get a sense as to what we're starting to see here. So we've had seven folks respond so far, which is great. Um, I believe uh, the uh, respondent for G4 would like to change it to D2. I don't know, Emily Wall, if you're able to modify that or. I don't, know. I don't know how to do it on the fly, but when we compile everything. We'll make note of that. The, um, I'll make note of it, yeah. Perfect. All right, 11 responses. I think outside the panelists, that makes up most of our participants for this evening. So excellent. Um, so we have had 11 folks respond. Um, there is a clear majority that are in alignment um, looking for the general area to be in the D2 cell or square. And we'll go back to that in a second. Um, it looks like we have multiple folks that would like to see C2. Um, and then, um, uh, Looks like maybe one um, or two for E3 and G4. So a clear majority for D2, C2, E3, and G4 are behind that. Um, I'm sorry, G4 was supposed to be at D, D2. So um, looks like uh, another percentage increase for D2. Let's go back and look at D2, C2, and E3. If my mouse will let us go back here. Oops, too far. Okay, so D2 is this area right here. So pretty close, right on the, the center here, north of the center, um, adjacent to the um, existing campus with the intermediate, middle, and high school, and um, with some relatively um, large uh, parcels in that area. Um, as Al noted, this is um, where the um, Scarborough Downs um, uh, site is located, as well as, as others. Al, do you want to talk a little bit about D2, and then we can move on to the, um, the next highest um, uh, cell? 
Yep, D2 looks to be about 70 to 80% east of the interstate. Um, the largest available, or not available, but the largest parcel is the Scarborough Down site. There are several other parcels um, in close proximity to Highgis Parkway uh, that are within that area, predominantly not heavily developed as existing residential neighborhoods, more commercial um, neighborhoods, but also including what I believe is the end of um, Enterprise Business Park. I think that's one that's of the right sites. Yeah. Yep, that's Enterprise Business Park. Then there's three parcels that I believe are along um, Highgis Parkway, but the Downs is the largest land mass within that that grid and then i think it was c2 c2 um which is right next door right next door um but is actually west of the interstate the largest parcel i believe would be the existing beach ridge um speedway and that, um, I believe, is in C2. That is interesting in that it, that one is currently in front of the planning board um, for a potential project. Um, but I believe C2, the largest single parcel, would be the Beechridge Speedway. Excellent. And the other one that had um, some interest is E3. So let's go back up to E. So going down to E and 3, which is this square right here. Yep. So E3, a portion of E3 is the conserved land. Um, there's along the northerly part of E3, and this is where it gets a little hard because you could, you could vote for E2 or E3. Um, the Willowdale Golf Course is right along that border. Um, basically, the front nine, I think, is in E3, and the back nine is split between E2 and, and E3. Excellent. And as noted in the chat, there was one for G4, but uh, was later changed to D2. Two. So kind of right on these three is what we're seeing um, as potential um, or general areas in which we'd like to see the primary school. So um, all of them are, are fairly close to, to the center here. Um, each of those is within the um, three mile uh, encompassed in the three mile ring. Um, from from the center. All right. So what we will do for next steps um, is summarize what we learned here tonight from um, from this workshop and make sure that that information gets out to everyone um, and also do a comparison between what we've heard from the community this morning and or the sorry this morning this evening and the building committee and look for um, where things are in alignment. If there is any misalignment, we'll definitely wanna talk about that and come up with a um, consolidated um, list of uh, priorities and um, general um, prioritized locations. Um, but want to again open up uh, to let folks know that there are many ways to get involved. Um, you can become a member of the visioning group um, that is part of the educational visioning group, um, really talking about what goes in um, to the thought process of this future school. Um, and there'll be different workshops. We we're gonna have those this spring, but have now moved them to the fall because um, uh, we know that the school year is winding down. Um, and then you can also apply to be part of the building committee or a subcommittee. And those subcommittees are communication, sustainability and building systems, site design or educational specifications. And there's a link here for everybody to um, go to if they would like to apply for those. Um, and uh, the um, building committee will get back to folks um, that are interested. 
The next forum that we have scheduled um, will be this fall. Um, we know that it's tough to engage in the summertime with the beautiful state that we all live in. Everyone is uh, enjoying uh, the great outdoors and, and vacations and travel. So the next time we will have a forum will be in September, October. And we invite you all to be part of that. That will be where we start to talk about crafting the design statement, really the vision for the um, building project. Um, and so a great educational session on 21st century Entry, best practices and future ready schools, um, as well as an interactive process on um, really defining the essence of, of the new school. So look for um, dates on that. Um, and then um, everything um, regarding the project is uploaded to um, the website. Um, so if you have any questions, you can access it there. And we're in the process of putting together a frequently asked question um, list as well. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff for Q&A. And I'll stop sharing so we can see everyone. Um, there you go. All right, great. Well, for the folks who uh, have been able to participate and, and listen in to our presentation this evening, just wanted to provide an opportunity uh, either to type in the chat um, any questions uh, that that any of us here on the as a panelist can can address. We also welcome if folks want to come off mute and ask questions too. Um, please do. Well, you must have really crushed it, Al. You, you addressed it all. I think it's too nice a night outside. Everybody's looking out their windows. That is definitely problematic. We haven't had a lot of those. No. Yeah, if there if there are any questions on the process or ways to to get involved or um, to follow along with with the process, definitely reach out. Um, and uh, we get back to folks with questions that are received. Um, did everyone enjoy the interactive process and um, weighing in this evening? That was great, and we can and and folks can certainly find a cloudy, rainy day to uh, to watch the uh, our video recording as well. Get get the information. Perfect. So thank you, thank you um, for putting all of that together, all that information, and, and going through the walking us through the process. Absolutely, more than happy to do it and look forward to everyone joining us this fall and getting, getting engaged um, in the process. So give a couple comments there, Jeff. All right, any, any um, final comments, either Andrew or Dana? No, appreciate the time, uh, great presentation and uh, looking forward to more engagement from the community. Yes, thank you for all the hard work. Things are going great. Just uh, put in the plug for all your friends and family and everybody else you know to join a committee or subcommittee. I have to get my plug every time. Very good, Andrew. <laughs> well done, well done. Well, great. Good. Thank, thank you all. We hope you have a beautiful night. Get out there and enjoy it. And uh, look forward to having you come and join us at any of the building committees or sign up for any of the committees and, and community forums. Have a good night. Take care, everyone. Good night.